Michael, did I ever tell you about the time that Jesse Jackson checked me in public? Ever tell you about that? He checked you in public. Jesse Jackson did. Jesse and, Jackson. No, you didn't. Public. So, so I gotta hear the story. I gotta hear this. Come on. Yeah. What so, happened? Where I don't was remember it? the year. I don't remember the year. This was in Chicago. The White Sox uh, his, asked me to his come space, to Chicago. Too. In his space, too. In his in yeah. his town. Okay. The White Sox asked me to come to Chicago to moderate a, a panel on the Negro Leagues. And I made a passing, matter-of-fact comment that, it, you know, looking back, I had been conditioned and brainwashed, to, frankly, to think this way. But I was just kind of going through Major League Baseball and Negro League history, and I just remarked, again, matter-of-fact, that... Jackie Robinson had been called up to the major leagues. And Jesse Jackson was like, oh. Jack, he was like, Jackie Robinson wasn't called up to the major leagues when he integrated baseball in 1947 with the Dodgers. It's like, that would suggest that the Negro Leagues were somehow inferior to the American and National League. Come on, I was Jesse. Like, come on, oh. Jesse, stop it. I was like, ah. No. I was like, He's I was wrong. like, okay. All right. I was like, point well taken. I was, I was like, fair enough. Fair enough. So I thought of that exchange, and I never said that again. I never used the words Jackie Robinson was called up as, to, as if to say it's another level. I never used the, the words Jackie Robinson was called up again ever since Reverend Jesse Jackson let me know what time it is, or what time it was, the case may be. So that story, that, that experience came to mind today when I saw this fantastic news. I mean, it's too easy to say that Major League Baseball hit a home run late in the game, but that Major League Baseball hit a home run, if not a grand slam, by uh, announcing today that they will be belatedly, again, to just emphasize this, designating the Negro Leagues as major leagues and adjusting records between 1920 and 1948, accordingly, uh, in the official statistics. And this is and has been uh, our national pastime. It may not be the most popular sport in America now, but it's still considered, uh, at least has a ceremonial title, of our national pastime. It was for a long time. Uh, you know, it's, it's very much America's game, and no game holds its records and statistics more sacred uh, than baseball. So this is nothing short of a big deal. Uh, I know that the temptation, and rightfully so, and even baseball acknowledges it. Now, I'll read a few statements in a second, but I do want to get your initial reaction. Uh, I know the temptation is to say, well, what took them so long? Damn right, took them long enough. Um, but, you know, it's, it's never too late to do the right thing. Uh, it's the centennial celebration for the Negro Leagues. Uh, and it, it caps off a pretty good late-year run for baseball when it comes to progress when you combine it with Kim Ang being hired by the Marlins as general manager, finally. The Indians being dropped as the team name uh, for the Cleveland baseball team, finally. And now recognizing the Negro Leagues as major leagues in their own right. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's working toward righting a wrong. You can never fully right the wrong with segregation. But it's a major step in that direction. And I love it. I, I, I'm so excited and so fascinated to unpack and excited to, to unpack this story with you, Michael Holly. Uh, I, I love the Negro Leagues. Uh, I don't love this news. I'm conflicted by the news, but I love Negro League okay. baseball and Negro League baseball history on many levels because it's been a part of our culture uh, since the founding of the Negro Leagues, I believe, in 1920. So I've always... Uh, just been fascinated by the history uh, to the point where one of my favorite plays by the late great, the genius uh, August Wilson fences. One of, that's one of my favorite plays because of the main character Troy and his connection mm -hmm. to Negro League baseball. He was a little uh, bitter that he was a great baseball player, but he didn't have an opportunity to uh, yeah. practice his craft like other white people in the area, in Pittsburgh, like most yeah, of August yeah. Wilson's plays were based. So August Wilson and, and Troy in fences. I used to yeah. rock uh, Homestead Gray's hats and, and, uh, yeah, man. and the, the, the Pittsburgh Crawfords and, and kind of go 
kind of walk some of those spaces. As you know, I went to college in Pittsburgh, so I would walk some of those spaces to figure out uh, where, where exactly did the Homestead Grays play? Where were the Pittsburgh uh, Crawfords playing? You know, the, uh, the, the black newspaper in Pittsburgh was a huge part of baseball history. So every step, I appreciate the history of it. And because I appreciate the history of it, I don't love the news today because you mm. can't take it back. You can't take it back. It, I, I don't yep. know, one, I don't know if it's Major League Baseball's place to say that the Negro Leagues were Major League Baseball. Maybe nobody, maybe we don't have we don't have the privilege of saying either league was the major league when neither league was able to be inclusive. One league was a response to the other's racism. So the mm -hmm. Negro Leagues existed because Major League Baseball refused to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. That's one. And I got in, I got in a lot of trouble. I shouldn't say trouble. I got a lot of pushback. Uh, right, right around 2000 when Major League Baseball came out with its all-century team. Mm. You remember this. A lot of people remember it because that was the opportunity where Jim Gray kind of fronted on Pete Rose. Like, hey, Pete, you know, you're on the all-century team, but hey, you want to take this opportunity to admit that you bet on baseball? And Pete Rose was <laughs> like, yo, Jim, how are you going to roll up on me like this, right? So that, yeah. that was one of the memorable exchanges from the all-century team right around 1999-2000. But I wrote, uh, as a columnist uh, for the Boston Globe, I wrote at the time, Major League Baseball does not have the right to have an all-century team when for half of the century you eliminated black yeah. players. Yeah. How are you going to have an all-century team? You can't. Yeah. You're yeah. going to have a, a, a century, a half-century, you can have a half-century team. You cannot have an all-century team when you didn't let everybody involved. So I just feel like I understand. I always thought the Negro Leagues were a legitimate yes. baseball league. How could they not? Yes. Common sense tells you, of course. And look what yes. happened. Look what happened. As soon as Major League Baseball was integrated, what happened? Your rookie of the year is Jackie Robinson. And you had MVPs like Roy Campanella and Don Newcomb. You had all these great players getting it done, great black players who were denied. Yeah, yeah. Years before, Hank Aaron getting it done, all these people. So you're not, t duh, I know, I know. I know. I know. You know what, Michael? You know, you know what I love about that? I, bravo. Bravo, and I mean that because it's like you're one of the most passionate people I know. I can feel the fury here in Connecticut, and, and I get it, man, and I feel you on that. No, I do. I feel you on that because it feels like, like I mean, just to put it bluntly, when you know white people to tell us that we were just as good at baseball as they were? You know, like, I, I, I got you, brother. I got you. I feel, I, like, seriously, we there on that, right? I, I, I was thinking about this earlier. Is it fair for me to compare this? Obviously, you know, two significantly different projects, but nonetheless uh, reflective of the racial history of this country in general, but specifically the sports. When I read this today, what came to mind was this, this undertaking of, of, of designating the Negro Leagues as major leagues and incorporating uh, the statistics. This could be uh, baseball's equivalent of the 1619 Project by the New York Times in that it just reframes the conversation or attempts to reframe the conversation around the sports history for the masses in the mainstream. Um, but I understand exactly what you're saying because I, I struggled for the longest time. When we came out of the steroid era, and whether it's you know Bonds or, or, or Clemens or anybody else, McGuire, anybody that has not gotten into the Hall of Fame, you know, I understood that while... We all enjoyed the steroid era, yeah, uh, and all benefited from the steroid era. When it came time to punish players who either were proved to have been or uh, suspected to have been involved in performance-enhancing drugs, I was like, "So wait, we're going to put a, we're going to assign an asterisk next to certain player stats?" When, to your point, for most of baseball's history to that point, it had been segregated. We don't even know you know, for the most part, what the best players in Major League Baseball would have done against Negro League players or whether they'd have been as, have been as good. I mean, I, I, one of Troy's best rants was about, I think it was whoever the right fielder was for the Yankees, you know, that, that, he, that he couldn't, uh, you know, hold a candle to, to, to Troy and some of the other Negro League players, you know. So I, I, I get your frustration 
over, oh, here's Major League Baseball, all of a sudden bestowing upon the Negro Leagues, you know, the, the, the sacred, <laughs> you know, you guys are official now. I, I totally yeah. understand it. But nonetheless, what I do love about it, though, Michael, is it, it sparks these kinds of conversations and it sparks uh, perhaps more interest, more curiosity, frankly, more work when it comes to, and this, again, this centennial year, uh, evaluating, discussing, debating, and really just elevating uh, the rich tradition and history of Negro League Baseball. One of the things on my sports bucket list, man, is I, you know, I really would like to make it a point, and maybe you've already been there, I would like to make it a point at some, at some point to go to Kansas City and visit the Negro League Museum. Now, before, before I pass it back to you, I would like to kind yeah. of do my little, you know, sports thing and, and just kind of give you some quotes because there are some statements that speak to what you just said. And that's why I kept yeah. stressing belated and long overdue that this is not something that most people needed to hear to recognize the legitimacy of the Negro League. So I'll start with, uh, with Rob Manford, um, Major League Baseball Commissioner Rob Manford. Uh, he said, all of us who love baseball have long known that the Negro Leagues produce many of our game's best players, innovations, and triumphs against a backdrop of injustice. We are now grateful to count the players of the Negro Leagues where they belong as major leaguers within the official historical uh, record. Feels like we should now go to the president of the Negro League Baseball Museum in Kansas City, Missouri, as Mr. Bob Kendrick, who we hope to, thank you, Courtney, have on the show later this week. Uh, he said, the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum is thrilled to see this well-deserved recognition of the Negro Leagues. In the minds of baseball fans worldwide, this serves as historical validation for those who had been shunned from the major leagues and had the foresight and courage to create their own league that helped change the game and our country too. This acknowledgement is a meritorious nod to the courageous owners and players who helped build this exceptional enterprise and shines a welcome spotlight on the immense talent that called the Negro Leagues home. And lastly, this is John Thorne, the official historian of Major League Baseball. And this is to your point, Michael. The perceived deficiencies of the Negro League structure and schedule, scheduling were born of MLB's exclusionary practices and denying them Major League status has been a double penalty, much like that exacted of Hall of Fame candidates prior to Satchel Paige's induction in 1971. Granting MLB status to the Negro Leagues a century after their founding is profoundly gratifying. So like you said earlier, it wasn't that the Negro Leagues weren't as good. They just, and, yeah. and somebody uh, said this in the, in the, in the Ringer's great write-up, they just didn't have the money and the financing to put on the same show that the American and National Leagues did. Well, didn't have the money, didn't have the financing, and didn't have the means to yeah. enter the major leagues, and so. Well, yeah, that part. Too. Yes, it. I mean, that, I mean, that's that's a big part of it, and and I. As I said, man, it's, it's, I'm, I'm conflicted because, I like to see I like to see this recognition. I like to see this honor, mm -hmm. and in some ways it is an honor, and in some ways it's Shakespearean, man. It really is tragic that, it, it would be like somebody getting an award or getting recognition after their time. Well, they, but they players. literally are. I mean, this is this is 3,400 plus players. But some Michael, of them are not alive. Is what I'm saying. Some, exactly. Most of them, this is a posture. There are some in their 90s that can, and then people's families. But you're absolutely right. But most of these people, they're not alive to be able to get this uh, validation or gratification, if you will. And and how far how far do we take it? Um, uh, oh, here we go. Here's an R word. I mean, are we talking about reparations here. Like, how far do we take it? <laughs> really. I mean, if you're part of Major League Baseball, then uh, Major League Baseball players, Major League Baseball veterans have a pension. So if you if you play in a, in a majors for 10 years, it's, it doesn't even have to be 10 years to be eligible for a pension. So how far do we take it? Uh, for, and here's another thing. Uh, I have a great book uh, on my shelf uh, over here somewhere uh, by David Halberstam. The book is called Summer of 49. So Summer of 49, and this is what, a couple of years after integration, summer 49, you got, you know, Joe DiMaggio and, uh, of the Yankees and Ted Williams of the Red Sox, and they're going at it. And these are two of the great players, two of the greatest players in Major League Baseball. But they're 10 years into their career at that point. 10 years. 
You know, I Joe DiMaggio. What could, what, what, what could have been? What could have been? Just, right. just it just right. eats at you. Right. It, yeah. Right. Yes. I, I get you. Like yeah. Joe DiMaggio insisted on being introduced when he was alive as the greatest living ball player. Mm -hmm. That that was part of that was part of the gig. You wanted Joe DiMaggio to show up. Uh, he wanted to be introduced as the greatest living ball player. Is that true? Or te did, did, did Ted Williams want people to say, there goes the greatest there hitter? There goes the greatest hitter. hitter. We'll never <laughs> yeah. know. Yeah. We'll never know. Because there are some who used to say, and they flip it around and say, hey, Josh Gibson is the black Babe Ruth. And people say, oh, no, Babe Ruth Babe is Ruth the white Josh is Gibson. the white Josh Gibson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we just yeah. we just don't know what it is, and at, at this point, including the statistics, how far, how far do we want to go with it? Uh, how far can we go realistically? Yeah. Well, and, and the other part too, and I, listen, I I'm I'm so happy you're reacting this way, and I and I feel the same way. You know, I'm never one to give out cookies. You know, I, I don't I don't we, we talk about this all the time, especially lately with Republicans. I'm not you don't you don't get a you don't get credit for being a day late and a dollar short. However, um, I do I do enjoy it because, I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I can't speak to what other shows are doing. Like I was so excited to to, to lead off our show talking about this, you yeah. know, and I, and I just hope it's, it's an ongoing conversation and an education. But the question of why it took them so long, this is another reason why Major League Baseball deserves some credit. But. Nonetheless, let's recognize that this isn't something, while there are people like, you know, researchers John Holloway and Larry Lester and many, many others who have been fighting this fight for decades, okay, this is something that Major League Baseball, I guess ironically, in a summer of so-called racial reckoning, where this country at least appeared to be ready to come face to face with this uh, the, the the symptom that is police brutality, the symptom of the disease that is racism that has infected this country since its founding. Um, interestingly enough, the pandemic, the, the disease that is COVID-19, and what it did to this past Major League Baseball season actually provided the impetus to finally go forward with, uh, you know, integrating Negro League history into that of Major League Baseball history. And here's what I mean in particular. So, and, and, I, and this, again, I learned all of this today. I was, I was today years old when I learned all of this, okay? So, uh, <laughs> all right, man. MLB's, all right. MLB's Special Baseball Records Committee. This is in 1969, a five-man, all-white body, uh, they bestowed Major League status on six circuits. And I'm reading right now from uh, Ben Lindbergh's wonderful write-up for The Ringer. Um, and they did not include um, the Negro Leagues because of uh, scheduling irregularities, inconsistent playoff formats, the frequency of unofficial games, media coverage, ballpark capacity, player skill level, number of crossover. Yeah. So this is what uh, Lindbergh goes on the right for the ringer. The existence of the pandemic altered 2020 season, which of course counted as major league, made it harder to defend the exclusion ahead, of the now. Negro Leagues on Go account ahead. of scheduling quirks or a lack I of consistency in format. MLB's centennial celebrations of the Negro Leagues conducted amid swelling public support for the Black Lives Matter movement and national demonstrations against police violence and structural racism only made it more glaring that the league was still snubbing those past players by neglecting to sanction their status as major leaguers. Those circumstances gave rise to a rapid reappraisal. So this isn't something that MLB has been working on. They just woke up to this. So, so yeah. Michael, I share in your frustration and your aggravation what took you so damn long. And tell but us this something. This is what I want to say. I, I, I'd be remiss, and both of us, would be remiss as as black sports writers. That's how we came up as black yes. sports writers, both of us, before yes. we got into speak on it. Uh, you know, TV and radio, everything else. I'd be remiss if we didn't on this day, on this historic day, say thank you, Wendell Smith from the Pittsburgh mm -hmm. Courier, who was one of those people who would go, who would who was an irritant in trying to publicize 
Negro League baseball players and saying yes. to an all-white league, how about this guy? How about that guy? Thank you, Sam Lacey in Baltimore for writing about uh, black baseball players and furthering the cause and beyond. And when we got to uh, Major League Baseball and integration in the sport, and a guy we know, we both know very well, we had uh, the Larry pleasure Whiteside. of working with. Larry White, Great Larry White. I, I, knew, I knew where you were going. I knew where you were Who going. Who took that Thank spirit you, of saying. Thank you, Claire Smith. But go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. That's Speak right. Who on. took that spirit and said, hey, um, that's the spirit that Wendell Smith had, said, what about them? What about them? And that was and not on the fields, but in the press boxes overlooking the field. The, the lists. <laughs> Larry, Larry Whiteside, Whiteside had a list. When, he was, when Larry Whiteside would see a black reporter he didn't know, he'd be like, what's your name? What's your and name? he'd write them down. And he'd add you to the list. Michael got added to the list. I got added to the list. That's what I'm saying, man. As, as, as disappointing as it is that it took this long to get here, it's a great day to celebrate not only Negro League history, uh, but also just to celebrate all the people who made this day possible and who were working behind the scenes and in the shadows, uh, like you said, to bring recognition to these players, to this tradition, to this history. That's right. Great, and, and listen, man, I'm not even... I, I, you, you, you were more of a baseball man than I am. I'm not even on front. I'm not, I'm not some baseball historian. I mean, I collected baseball cards. I grew up loving baseball. I, I, I drifted away from it as the years went on. But I, I lost my card collection in Hurricane Katrina. I, you know, but my dad loved the Chicago Cubs. I watched the Atlanta Braves on TBS. I rooted for the Braves, you know, in the early 90s. I, I love the game, but I, I wasn't so attached to the game where I'm some walking encyclopedia or historian. However, I love good stories. I obviously love sports. I love justice. And I love giving credit where credit is due. I love recognition. Uh, and I love doing what's right. And it took them long enough. But this is the right thing. You're right. You can't undo it, Michael. You can't undo That's right. what was lost. But we can still recognize what these people did in spite of, uh, of the system being against them. Hey, thanks for watching Brother From Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Peacock. Appreciate you.